Peace and blessings, everybody. It's um, Saturday, August the 17th, the year 2019, and I'm going to begin part two of X on the book titled There Was a Man, The Saga of Gordon Call, A True Story by Capstan Turner with A.J. Lowry. Keep in mind that both authors have now died and this is a rare and out-of-print book, and it was a miracle of God that um, we managed to obtain a copy. So we have been in communications with Yori Von Call and Scott Fall, who know about this book. Yori has confirmed that he has read it, and the foreword was written by Yori's mother, the wife of Gordon Call, Joan Call. So, um, again, the reason I say Part 2 of X it's because I don't know how many parts this will go up to. I'm going to read about 20 minutes today. And we'll start on page 6. Part 1 ended at the bottom of page 5. It's Roman numeral 5 and Roman numeral 6. So here we go. Or the government borrows checkbook money from a commercial bank. It is the same thing. Just printed debt. A result is that one of these unit bills won't buy what a dime would in 1930. The government and bankers can then do such nonsense as relend this borrowed money to farmers, enticing them to become overburdened and pay exorbitant interest. Fact is, any interest at all is us usurious on fiat money. And that is just, that is just printed up. I think that the big plot is to foreclose out the small family farm farmers and letting a relatively few agribusinesses do the farming and own the land. We need to return to a Christian common law under which this nation was founded. For example, the federal government really has no right meddling in education. It has no power to do so. Thomas Jefferson endorsed public government schools primarily because religious instruction would be a benefit to both the individual and society. The schools have been transformed into tools of atheistic, secular, humanist, and socialist welfare state forums for propaganda and indoctrination. I gotta pause here and inject a personal commentary that this book was written in 1991. Little Johnny is still not taught to read and compute properly, much less to think for himself. Gordon would continue. The biggest piece of nonsense that ever came out of Washington was when Charles Evans Hughes said the Constitution meant whatever the pr Supreme Court said it did. Legal realism. Actually, the Constitution is a simple document which states quite plainly what it means. Putting an apple on the table and saying that it is an orange does not make it so. Any doubts are quickly dispelled by reading the Federalist Papers and the documents illustrative published by the 69th Congress to determine meaning. The bottom line is that power rests with the people, not with the officials and bureaucrats. It is not a perfect document. The fact that I had relatives fighting on both sides during the War for Southern Independence speaks to that. Some issues require interpretation, it is admitted, but rewriting the Constitution under the guise of interpretation is a different kettle of fish, especially when the net result is to centralize power and strip citizens of their rights. Call would assert, the proper role of government is to protect the citizens from one another, from foreigners, and from their own regulations. God endowed us with resources to be combined with our labor to produce the products we need to sustain life. Thus, life, liberty, and property are basic to our pursuit of happiness. Government should protect the individual and family, the historic basic social unit, in this regard. Instead of this, our government has sought to enslave us in the name of assuming responsibility for any and all personal or group problems. Government cannot give anyone anything. It can only take from one and give to another, stifling the incentives of both in the bargain, and peeling off a good chunk 
for the bu bureaucrats in the process. Why should government think it is responsible for every social ill? Once it commences to fight one problem, it is, is it not logical, logically responsible for all problems then? The truth is, government has no responsibility for any of it, and the record is clear. That which government attempts to change, and those whom it might try to help, end up being victims in the long run, where the solutions are inevitably worse than the ills. More harm is usually caused than good is done, regardless of intentions. The self-serving self tyrants who contrive our wars and demolish our Constitution use devious and ingenious devices to gain their ends. One method is to get vast hordes to work for them in controlling the people by promising the military and bureaucracy huge pensions to be paid, not by the current populace, but by the posterity who are taxed for this social contract. Commitment without representation. Similarly, working sheep are sheared of their wool in the name of social security programs. Little squawking was heard because those in the early decades of the program stood to receive vastly more in transfers, transfers than they would pay into the treasury. Thus the monstrous fraud of taxing people who work in order to give to those who do not work was institutionalized. The success of this giant pyramid game, a chain letter pure and simple, depended on each generation of workers having larger real incomes and thus receiving the transfers remaining at a low ratio numerically. This has not happened, and the game is about up in this ripoff. The house of cards is tumbling. Another great ill of our country, Call would say, is the adoption of the second plank of the Communist Manifesto, the Progressive Personal Income Tax. It has not been ratified into law. As anyone who has studied the subject knows, this is patently unconstitutional and is legalized plunder by government to obtain funds which it uses for improper government functions. Since the government knows this and the Supreme Court will not review an, an IRS case because of this, <coughs> the, income, the income tax is called voluntary. It exists without legal basis. Can you realize the word income is not even defined in the Internal Revenue Code? That This is no accident. If it were defined, the code would be invalid on its face. Even though millions do not bother to file income tax returns, return what? The sons of Satan still selectively murder or prosecute a handful such as me in order to terrorize the remaining people who might protest the illegal confiscation, the plunder. Most people then yearly send their tithes to the synagogue of Satan out of both ignorance and fear, terror. The IRS operates largely outside the law. It views itself as being above the law or its own code book. Only the KGB can be compared to it as a government tool of oppression. A great number of individuals or organizations unwittingly assist the power elite in subduing the, the free people of America. However, top leaders in some organizations are certainly accessories to the plot. The elitist use many fronts, like the Freemasons, the human cattle, Goyim, to further their aims. The Masons are in an organization as anti-Christian and pro-Satan as one can possibly get, but most don't know it. You will never hear the word Jesus in any lodge. Only the very highest Masonic degree holders fully understand its satanic objectives. Often, with their burn hospitals and such, Masonic orders appear as angels of light, Lucifer, or as wolves in sheep's clothing. We must pray that each member becomes aware of this and resigns from this Antichrist group, which is doing so much to undermine our American heritage. The erosion of our freedoms has been gradual, or Fabian Socialism. named after the Roman general Fabius, who wore his enemies down inch by inch. The trend may well accelerate in, in the future, Call would add. He had read Gulliver's Travels with its tr threads of tyranny, one strand at a time. Until freedoms are gone and we are bound with the chains of tyranny. 
Grouping the various isms, they appear as a picture of conspiracy. At this late hour in their at this late hour in their timing, different names are used to achieve power. Those who aspire to rule the world refer to it as their new world order. Keep in mind, all of this was written in 1991, and Gordon Call was killed in 1983. So if they're quoting Gordon Call, he was talking about this stuff prior to 1983. The humanist may talk of the Global 2000 from reports, of submitted, from reports submitted to the Carter administration, proposing that the humanist, humanist millennium, millennium should begin in that year. Cultists may talk in terms of the New Age, or the Rainbow, or the Aquarian conspiracy. Groups such as the Illuminati, Trilaterals, Council on Far Foreign Relations, or international bankers all promote one world government through such evil devices as the Holocaust Convention Treaty. Whatever the name, all of the foregoing promote, in the final analysis, a war against Christianity which connotes an attack on biblical morality, private, mora private property, free enterprise, and individual liberty. Whatever the ism or the stated aims, the final objective entails the establishment of a world government, a total destruction of the family life as we know it, and a new world religion where the state is the only God that can be worshipped or discussed. When Pastor Broden, this is a personal commentary again, when Pastor Broden goes out and protests Drag Queen Story Hour in Dallas, Texas, that's an attack upon the family unit. Gordon Call was writing about attacks on the family unit prior to 1983. Continuing on, the above is a sampling of the beliefs firmly held by Gordon Call. This book is not particularly concerned with Call's beliefs. It is neutral. However, the story is quite concerned with a person's right to embrace unconventional convictions and with his right to propose them to others. Among other things, the story tells of how the government treated Gordon Call and his family and his friends. One should note that Gordon Call affair is no anomaly. Not an, is not an isolated instance in recent years. Take a person who despises and shuns white-shelled eggs and condemns those who eschew the much superior brown eggs at every opportunity. How should he be treated by a society in which 97% of the people use white eggs exclusively? Is he ostracized? Should he be investigated, prosecuted, and penalized? by one sanction or another? The trouble with such an oversimplified analogy is that, it's, is that the stakes are much higher in the real-life call case. Should he be wrong, the errors of his opinions will be evident in due course with little damage done. However, were his conclusions to be correct, our constitutional republic as we know it is on its last legs. Instead of the government and its agents being servants of the people, the roles will switch with the bureaucrats ruling the populace, with the accompanying demise of the individual liberty. What makes one pause is that Gordon Call is quite an intelligent man, reached, reached his conclusions after years of intense investigation and study. The rest of us generally have values and opinions predicated on casual exposure to the controlled mass media, uninformed associates, apathetic relatives, government schools, and a de desire to conform to the prevailing norms and to be socially acceptable, Call believed this to be the road to slavery. As Gordon Call's granddaughter narrates the Call story in late 1985, the reader is invited to determine which actors are the serious lawbreakers. Those familiar with the Constitution can do this best, but which public schools teach it in depth? It suffices to rely on one's innate sense of justice. The central objective of the U.S. Constitution was, in Jefferson's words, to bind government officials with the chains of the Constitution to keep them from their mischief. This story will il illustrate its dismal fa failure to put shackles on the government. Bureaucrats are primarily concerned with their internal regulations, not the Constitution. Legislators have their eye on the short-term political expedient of the moment as they, as they ever seek higher taxes and more controls on the people for the people's own good, of course. 
Courts are much more concerned with precedent than with the Constitution. Thus, the noble and supreme document is rendered relatively ineffectual in hamstringing the immediate goals of those in seats of power. Gordon Call sought nothing less than a complete turnaround of this trend and for the government to cease destroying the people. One may say that the conditions are different now from when the Constitution was written. The answer to that is simple. The Constitution provides the machinery for amend amending or revising its provisions. Usurpation by officials of the intent of the framers of the document, whether separately or in concert, is not the proper way. Upon receiving his Nobel Prize in Literature, William Faulkner yearned for the writers to return to writing about the human heart, the only thing worth writing about. I surely hope this book meets your test, Bill, as it is bound to do if heartbreak and grief get points. Although it is wishfully both entertaining and informative, the objective is not to idolize the principal subject nor his ideas. The basic purpose is to expose government tyranny and oppression as it exists in the United States today. Before the story starts, the reader should be cognizant of certain Gordon Call characteristics. First, he believed in the literal reading of the Constitution regarding an individual's right to bear arms and to protect his family and property. This is not, <clears throat> this is not an uncommon among farmers and cattlemen of the West. Next, Next, and contrary to scores of news reports of his memberships, he belonged to absolutely no organizations in 1983. He was not even an official member of the small denominational Heaton Bible Church, which he attended and supported in Heaton, North Dakota. He was more of a single voice than a joiner. Lastly, he believed that when physically attacked, he had the right to defend himself and his friends or family in the vicinity. This is dramatically illustrated in a letter he wrote the night of a shootout with Lawman near Medina. When you come under attack by anyone, it becomes a matter of survival. I was forced to kill. This is Gordon Call. When you, when you come under attack by anyone, it becomes a matter of survival. I was forced to kill an American P-51 pilot one day over Burma when he mis mistook us for Japs. I let him have the first shot. He missed, and I did not. I felt bad, but I knew I had no choice. Gordon was in a similar predicament when he killed either one of the two marshals and wounded three other lawmen in Medina, North Dakota on February 13, 1983, after being cornered and assaulted by them. Had he been a violent person with a propensity for rage, he could have killed them all. He used minimal force in self-defense. He was a veritable one-man army with nerves of steel. No intention exists of making a folk hero, folk hero of Gordon Wendell Call. What is intended is to reveal the truth about the man, which is quite different information from the myriad Call news stories, virtually, virtually all of which are laced with inaccuracies. Much of the bad press about him is deprived from verbal support he received from various crackpots, hate groups, cultists, and quasi-underground organizations. Ideas will accept from whatever, from whatever quarter. Unjustified derogatory comments and reports by government officials also were a primary source of such publicity. The lack of proper research, indifference to responsibility, and socialist values of the media in general are also to be faulted. Those who knew him well, invariably, had a good impression of Gordon. One neighbor said, I don't think he would tell a lie if his life depended upon it. He was even-tempered and very soft-spoken. He exuded an air of quiet self-assurance and confidence. He had a good sense of uh, humor. He had a good sense of humor. One could say he was paranoid about government agents were it not for two things. One, his fears and predictions about what was to happen to himself and his property became actual events. Paranoia is a false fear. Two, he was certified sane, found deeply religious and without psychosis by a prison psychiatrist in 1977. Most of us merely assume our sanity. He would not go into debt for any purpose. Therefore, he was not dunned nor needed to heed such business signs as 
We have no regular credit manager. If you want credit, go to hell and wait. He had a lifelong reputation for kindness to his family and those in need of help. He worked long and hard, an expert, mechanic, good electrician, and an energetic grain farmer. He was unswerving in his religious beliefs and his devotion to stand for individual freedom. He paid his local taxes without objection and never caused trouble for others. He possessed an impeccable morality, by and large a very good citizen and accepted as such by the community. Gordon Call had all the personal char characteristics to which Boy Scouts aspire. His bravery was so great that an observer would conclude that he was devoid of fear. Gordon once told a, a neighbor's children about a time in World War II when his crew was grounded in Calcutta, Calcutta, India, waiting for a dust storm to subside. While there, he and his buddy came upon a snake charmer. After watching for a while, and just for the fun of it, Gordon reached into the bag, pulled out the cobra, spat into its eye, and put it back. Gordon had a philosophy that one would not die until it was his time to go. He was not devoid of fear. Fear was simply not apparent. As one former government official observed empathetically, he is a man who hurts just like the rest of us. Gordon's honesty was beyond question. In one instance, a grain buyer made a check out to call only, at the same time acknowledging that it was supposed to be made out jointly to the lien holder FHA on the grain. I know you always pay your debts, he explained. Another incident, another incident showing the integrity happened on a stormy, cold North Dakota afternoon when G Gordon parked his car to go into a Carrington hardware store to buy some nails. His wife and two-year-old child remained in the car. They had come to town mainly to get a couple of sacks of bri briquet or coal for their furnace, all they could afford. The family's only income at the time was a $33 per month pension for Gordon's 30% disability for war wounds. He carried shrap shrapnel in his hip and other scars. As his wife tells of the event, he waited over two hours in the car in 30 degree below zero weather, a long time, even with the heater going. When he finally came, I said, where were you? He responded, as I was coming to the car, I looked down and saw a billfold. So I looked into it. It had money in it and a driver's license. So I, I've been looking all over, the, all over for the person so I could return it to her. She had been working in one of the stores, had just gotten her check that morning and cashed it on her way to lunch at a cafe. She had lost it on her way back to work. She was so happy Gordon returned it that she couldn't believe it. She wanted to give him a dollar as a re reward, but he wouldn't take it. Even though we were broke, that dollar would have bought us 10 pounds of sugar and three loaves of bread. Gordon always believed in the golden rule. At other times over the years, when we were really down and out financially, his reputation as the best mechanic in the area caused people to bring their ailing cars to him to fix. Sometimes he wouldn't even charge them anything when we really needed the money. Okay, I'm going to stop on page 14, and we'll pick up later with part 3, but this is the end of part 2.